So my name is Nicholas Horton from Amherst College, and I can't tell you how excited we are. We've tried to greet all of you um, and really excited by what's been happening, but I'm even more excited to really introduce to you right now a remarkable individual. Um, you know, Fernando's full bio is available, but he's a professor in statistics at the University of California, Berkeley. He also has these wonderful connections with Lawrence Berkeley Lab and their Department of Data Science and Technology, and as well as a really innovative role at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. What is really most remarkable for me about Fernando is his passion and success in bringing together communities and to really be thinking very hard and very carefully about how to ensure that people have the computational tools to do statistics and data science. He was the, uh, as a graduate student, probably, you know, as advisor, probably said, why are you writing IPython back in 2001? I had, my advisor said to me once, like, I would never forbid you for doing this, Nick, but, which meant I shouldn't be doing it. But, um, and then that really, he co-founded its successor, Project Jupiter. And Jupiter is, to me, one of the most exciting developments that are out there. Julia, Python, and R bringing together these really powerful open source environments that can really unleash a whole new generation of people with these computational tools. He's given multiple presentations all over the world. I've had the pleasure of interacting through some uh, National Academy's work and efforts that he's really been at the heart of. So without further ado, let me turn things over to Fernando. Thank you very much for making the trip out today. Thank you, Nick, and the organizing committee for this invitation. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here and to, to see you all. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the path, uh, the path that, uh, that brought me uh, to where I am today. Um, in context, uh, as I mentioned in the title of my talk, I come from Colombia. That's Colombia spelled with an O, the, the country, uh, not the one with a U, which is the university. Uh, and specifically, I'm, I'm from Medellin. I just met uh, Adriana Perez, part of the organizing committee. Uh, my wife's name is Adriana as well. Uh, she's from Bogota. Uh, I'm from Medellin. Um, and Medellin is a, a beautiful city in the mountains, uh, roughly at the elevation of Denver, um, kind of nestled in a valley. Uh, it's a city that has had a fantastic rena urban renaissance in the last decade or so, but it's also a city with a very troubled history. Um, so for those of you who have, may have seen Narcos on, on Netflix, it's actually very pretty realistic. Uh, that picture is when Pablo Escobar, the big drug lord, was killed. That's about 10 minutes from my house. Um, so, so, and I, I remember the day when that happened. I was in college. I was an undergrad in physics. Uh, and so I kind of grew up in a context of, of both science and interest in ideas, but also of a lot of violence. And Colombia is just barely coming out of uh, some of the worst of that. Um, when I was an undergrad, uh, my training is in physics. And uh, what brought me to computation was a project to the kind of thing that every kid who liked math and computing in the, in the late 80s and 90s was, was doing, which was fractals, right? We, 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 all, wrote some, we all wrote some kind of code um, to do that. And, uh, and I didn't have a PC at the time. This was in 91. My mom had a PC at the office. Um, she, worked, uh, she worked at a university. And so I would go there on weekends uh, and write, write code there, which meant I did a lot of writing and debugging in my head on paper. I had these big things on paper. I would write the code on pa on, with a pencil and think about it. Um, and I actually, it's interesting because now a lot of what I've done is build tools to work with the computer and think interactively at the computer. And I wonder if we've lost a little bit of that because some of my thorniest bugs, I solve them away from the keyboard. Having to think about the problem when I was not wrapped up in the, in the, in, in the screen and the keyboard and kind of banging my head against it. So, I don't know. This is my own caveat about my own work. Maybe my 20-year-old my self has, uh, still has something to teach me. Mm. I moved from, uh, from Colombia. I applied to grad school to, um, to Colorado. Um, and uh, somebody else uh, mentioned kind of aiming high, and I think that's something that you all should keep in mind. I remember I coming from my, my recommendations were from, from professors in Colombia. I came from a university um, in Colombia. I had done some research as an undergrad, but I basically had no international credentials to speak of. Um, and I only applied to MIT, Harvard, and, uh, and Boulder in the US. I also applied to places in Europe. And, uh, and part of that was either I was going to be at an absolutely amazing place uh, from, a, from a, I, it had to be an amazing place scientifically and in physics. CU Boulder had just, uh, the physics department had just done the work that would lead to a string of Nobel Prizes in atomic physics because of Bose-Einstein condensation. 
Um, and it had to be at a place that I would enjoy living at. So that's the other part of this, which is Colorado is where the mountains are, and, uh, and where you can, be, you can be in this kind of terrain 45 minutes from campus. Uh, and that makes a difference, because you're going to work very hard in grad school. And that means that when you're not working very hard uh, in the lab or in the, in the office and whatever you do, you should be doing something that you care about and that is fun to you. And for me, that, a lot of that means spending time in the, mount uh, spending time in the mountains. I did a PhD in physics. I'm not a statistician. My training is in computational physics. So my PhD was in um, QCD simulations. Uh, I did a postdoc in applied mathematics also at CU Boulder in developing tools for, for uh, numerical solutions of PDEs. And uh, with that context, I think it's, it's worth talking about why I do the kind of work that I do and that I still do today, which has been a little bit odd. And I'm going to give first kind of a more official answer to that, uh, which comes from four perspectives. The first one is ethical, that building, building open tools for me is a, plays into a, a notion of fairness and, and, uh, and access. Uh, when I came to Colorado, the tools I was using for my research were a lot, a lot some of it were in-house developed codes, but a lot of it was based on proprietary tools like Mathematica and IDL, which obviously I had access to at CU Boulder. We had licenses for all that software. My mentors back in Columbia didn't, or if they, if they were going to buy one, the relative cost of a license relative to the, the budgets in Colombia is much, much more significant than here in the U.S. Um, and uh, sometimes those companies don't offer the kind of sweet deals that they give to U.S. universities. They don't offer them to other countries. And so it meant that there was a huge barrier for me to even sharing the work that I was now doing and the things I was learning in Colorado if I wanted to share that work with my colleagues back home. Uh, and so working with open and building open tools was, ha was driven by that. Normally, building and that was very important normally would prevent community building and collaboration. And that turned out to be very important for me in the long run. There's a, just a foundational epistemological argument that the notion of doing scientific work, whose mission is understanding, if you will, the black box of nature, and doing that with tools that you are legally prevented from understanding how they work, because if you go and look inside, they will sue you. That, to me, is just anathema to science itself. And so I simply could not accept that that would be a way of doing science. And finally, I was a geek. I like, I, like, I, like, I like programming. Python was an amazingly uh, appealing language from a technical standpoint. And so I started building tools in Python. But there's actually a, an, an important personal element to this, uh, which is that I was, all of this, all of those reasons are true. None of this is, is a lie. But what actually happened, what, what drove me into that, was being painted into a corner by a PhD in crisis, basically. I had my dissertation was going nowhere. Um, I, I was pretty unhappy with the work I was doing. I had lost interest in that very, very specific, narrow technical problem. Um, and what happened was, in that crisis, I did find support from an incredible second PhD advisor, and we'll come back to that later. This is important. Um, by my wife, who, while being also a grad student, gave me an incredible amount of support and helped me through that. And by getting a path forward out of being painted in that corner, by somebody who offered me a postdoc that looked very interesting and who would mentor me later uh, in, in a po in, as a postdoc into building a career. And basically sh said, if you can get through this, that door out there is a door that leads to really good and interesting work, and I will support you. And, uh, and that was very important, because I really, really was going nowhere. Um, and what I did was start writing code driven by this quote that, that, that I had learned about that some of you may have read. It's from Hamming, an a electrical engineer and numerical analyst from the 60s. This quote remains, is more important today than it was in the 60s. Today we have so much compute power and so much data that if we simply turn the crank, all we'll get is garbage out. And so your role is to think about what you're doing. And what I've been trying to do is build tools for this, to help with this. It began as a very simple, 2,200 lines of code, little tiny Python script. Um, I told my advisor at the time, the second one, the nice one, um, this would be <laughs> just an afternoon hack. Um, this would just take an afternoon. Uh, it's been tw almost 20 years now, so th those are my error bars and my time estimates for projects. If you ever review one of my grants, I did not say this. Uh, my timelines are great. My, my, um, and uh, what, what IPython was was an interactive environment to basically do the kind of workflow that we as scientists do with data, which is different from software engineering, where you're given a set of constraints and you're building a library for a well-defined problem. You're using the computer to think about your data. So you run a little bit of code, you look at the data, 
that makes you think about what code you run next and you keep iterating. This is a workflow that is very natural, whether you do it in R or in MATLAB or in Python or in Mathematica, that workflow is the natural workflow of using the computer as your thinking partner. And so IPython was a tool basically to do that in Python better. Python had a basic interactive shell, but it had limitations for a scientific workflow. The first thing that that did was it showed me that I could do something. And this is important because in the dark corner that I was in, I had gotten to the point of basically not believing that I could do anything good, that I could do anything useful. And just writing code that I put out online and that people began saying, hey, that's cool. I can use that. Can you add this feature to it? And then 24 hours later, I, could, I would do it and they would say, thank you. This is great. That actually made a huge difference in basically letting me sort of restart the engine to get going and to get working. And the second outcome is that I found a community. While I was working on this field of lattice QCD is a tiny, tiny dark corner at the intersection of theoretical physics, high energy, numerical computing. It's super complicated, and it's a very, very small subfield. And I didn't feel that I had a, a community of people to work in there. And I did find it here in neuroscience, for example. It turns out that I met at a, at a conference that I was invited to present my little IPython afternoon hack. I met John Hunter, who was a, at the time, working in pediatric neurology at UChicago on the analysis of epilepsy data from children who have severe epilepsy. And this was done, analysis done with a proprietary tool that he wanted to get away from. So John wanted, again, to do his work, not with proprietary tools. So this work that was about saving the lives of children could be shared with the world. And John began building a tool called Matplotlib, which has become basically the dominant tool for visualization in Python, out of the desire for building this. And what I found with John was bonding with a like-minded soul that wanted the same kinds of things, and we would collaborate, and IPython and Matplotlib have had this close collaborative partnership over the years. John became one of my closest friends. We taught courses all over the world. We organized conferences. We founded institutions. Very sadly, he passed away in 2012. To this day, his family, we are extremely close. We visit together. We, we still hang out with his, uh, with his kids. And that's something that I had not found in spaces where the only thing was competing for who has the longest CV, who has the most publications, et cetera. This was a space where people wanted to build things to actually make a difference. And, and that was incredible. It wasn't just IPython. At the time, what happened was a collection of people with a similar mindset began building many other tools. And so we were all using Python as the foundation, but we had, there was Matplotlib, there was SciPy, and there were a lot of domain-specific tools. And this, this tree keeps growing and growing. This is deliberately an old slide, kind of frozen in time around 2010, 2011, maybe. But this, this today, you would make the same slide with many, many more packages that are, that are very important. And all of that was driven by a community that became basically my, my home community across traditional boundaries. It was still hard. This is a slide from a talk that I gave at the annual meeting of the Applied Mathematics community, um, SIAM, in 2008. And a lot of the slide was basically, a lot of the talk was justifying our existence. It's like, oh, what is Python? And I had like slides like, what is it? Why open source? Why, why is it OK? Why is it acceptable to do this kind of work instead of doing the things that, the only things that you value, which are numerical algorithms, papers, uh, squeezing in a fraction of a percent in performance in this or that regime, right? Um, and so you can see that a lot of this slide is basically justification. It's justifying that we had a right to exist. And this slide sounds funny today because today the tools that we built are literally taking over the world. But in 2008, we were justifying kind of that, that we had a right to be there in the first place. Now, today, what we have specifically in Jupiter, which is something I'll talk a little bit more about, is actually something that I do not take credit for. This is a community effort. We would have none of what we have today if it had been me, the, little kind of the lonely grad student hiding from his advisor. That would not work. What we have is an amazing team of people who come from many walks of life. And this is a project that, even though, yes, I'm at Berkeley, and I am an academic at heart, and I love teaching and research, this is a project where we have people from industry, we have people from the community, we have people from government labs, we have people from universities, from all over the place. And it's a, it's a community that we've built where we really try to bring people ignoring kind of the existing boundaries and trying to say, if you want to do the right work with us and you work with the right values, we'll find a way to work with you. And funding-wise, that has meant this is what our current funding slide looks like. This is nothing like, like, like what you would see in a nor normal academic grant. There's one federal agency in there, and that's a small amount of money. Everything else has been private foundations and partnerships with companies like Bloomberg, like Netflix, like IBM, like Microsoft, et cetera. So it's a very, very different way of working. But that's OK. That's OK. 
I want to quickly check uh, who here has not used Jupiter ever. Okay, good. A good number of you folks. So depending on the audience, sometimes uh, we'll see later why. In some audiences now that number is, uh, is much smaller, but I'm, I'm glad to kind of have a chance to tell those of you who have never used these tools. So what, what we built was the evolution, I'm skipping here about 10 years of history, but the evolution of that little program that ran in the terminal where I could run a bit of code and a plot window would pop out was that around 2011, after many failed prototypes, we released um, a tool which was at the time called the IPython Notebook. We were still calling it IPython. And what the IPython Notebook offers is an environment where you can combine text, natural language, uh, written in Markdown, uh, but with a special insert for logic so that you can put mathematics in there, together with code, um, at the beginning in Python, it was IPython, um, together with code and with the output of that code, all of that is recorded into a single document. So you have one document that contains both your natural language and your computational piece and the output of the computation. And those three are woven together. Um, and all of it is accessed through a web interface. And that web interface can run locally on your laptop or it can run on a remote server anywhere you want, on a supercomputer, in the cloud, whatever. And the access is always the same. It's, it's a web interface. And it allows you to build your analysis share them with others, reproduce them, turning in th turn them into documents. It turns out that internally these things are data structures with a ton of metadata. So there's a lot of things you can do by basically injecting metadata in various places and using that metadata for other things. But what happened was as we built this tool, then we began extending it. And so the first thing was actually uh, at a conference, at a conference here, near here in Boston, uh, another science conference, I met with the, the core developer, at the lead developer, the creator at the time of the Julia programming language. They're based out of MIT. And, uh, and we started hacking. We just played hooky and skipped some of the talks. And we started hacking on integrating Julia with IPython so that he could call out to Julia. And uh, that worked fantastically. We had it working by the next day. I was giving a talk at MIT, and I was able to demo it the day after. It was very nice to have the core developer of the project being willing to commit to Git master, the Git master branch of the language, like hacks right in the core of the interpreter um, from a bar at a hotel. That was very useful. <laughs> he can't get away with that today. Uh, but, 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 but back in 2013, this was possible. And, uh, and so we built support for it um, in there by basically gradually gradually decoupling the notion that you had to run code in Python and turning it into a proper protocol where the thing that runs the code could be anything. It could be Python, but the thing that goes in here, at the end of the day, who cares if it's Python or something else? It's an element of code that has to be executed and something is going to come back. And we thought very carefully about what all the actions that could happen could be and should be and documented those as a proper protocol. Um, and so then we could implement the same thing for R. So one of my postdocs went to a meeting at, uh, at GitHub from the R OpenSci team uh, where a bunch of R experts were there. And he was able to basically build a prototype of, of R support so that you can have native R support in there. And then over time, the community adopted this. By having a proper, well-specified protocol, you build something that the community can adopt. Today, there's over 100 different, they're called kernels, where the back end can be your thing. And then the rest of the Jupyter machinery um, can you can use that with your own tool and this is the technical side of building a community which is building standards building open tools building open documentation that a community with the right feedback and the right communication can rally around and we can all we, we can all make uh, make better progress and that's what led to the name the name is not an acronym but we had at this point we had to rename it ipython was not an appropriate name anymore it was too python specific so julia python and r are the three open languages of data science if you will and that was the inspiration for the name it's not an acronym but it's a good inspiration for uh, for the name and these tools have been picked up um, very very broadly and as i said i'm originally a physicist my career has been an odd one but it's been hugely satisfying to think of things like um, Oh, I don't, well, we'll see if this thing has audio. Does this have audio? You, do we know? We'll, we'll see. Um, if um, that we contributed a teeny, teeny bit, we played a very small part in helping the team that made a an observational discovery that led to the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics, which was the observation of a prediction that Einstein made about 100 years ago when Einstein developed the field equations for general rel relativity. This is, this is the, the main equation for that that predicts that as masses move around in, in the universe, any mass moves around in the universe, it radiates energy. 
uh, as they accelerate, if they move under acceleration, uh, it, they radiate energy. And that energy travels, because of this constant right here, which is the speed of light, it, they travel at the speed of light. So just like when a charge accelerates and it produces light, laser light is exactly the radiation of electromagnetic energy, space-time energy also, uh, 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 um, gravitational energy travels in space-time by distorting space-time. That prediction was, was ver a very clean prediction. The experimental observation of that is an extraordinarily hard problem. Um, that's partly why they got the Nobel Prize for it. It took 30 years of, of work. It's a phenomenally difficult problem. And it's a phenomenally difficult problem actually in data science because the signal-to-noise ratio is so absurdly low that it's not like you just make an experiment and you make a data fit. You have to fish out of 21 orders of magnitude a signal out of the bottom, bottom of the noise. And so you have to have both very good physical models and very good statistical analysis to be able to, d to do this kind of thing. So the way the experiment works is there are, there's two detectors that measure, measure the changes in length of an interferometer, uh, one in Louisiana and one in Washington, of what that should look like. So these are models, numerical models, uh, that, that predict, uh, predict what, what that signal should look like. And after a ton of statistical analysis, of what that should look like. So these are models, numerical models, uh, that, that predict, uh, predict what, what that signal should look like. And after a ton of statistical analysis, this is the, this is the signal that, that we get. This is a, a figure from the first paper of the detection of the first detection of gravitational waves. And for us, it was humongously satisfying that when this was published, this entire paper is built with open source tools. Uh, it uses NumPy for the analysis, SciPy, Matplotlib, in fact, the color maps that are being used here were developed at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science and by the MATLAB community to have much better perceptual properties. If you're interested in color theory and in visual perception for good data visualization, I encourage you to read the blog post about how this was developed because it's, it's really cool. And this is probably going to be one of the most referenced and most important results in physics for the next decades to come. And to think that in 2008 we were justifying that we should be allowed to speak at conferences and that now this result is being built, is being presented with all the tools built by this community. Is, is amazing, and the LIGO team actually published all of their analysis are made available to you in the form of Jupyter Notebook. So if any of you wants to go and run the analysis and play with this code and play with this data and wonder if the statistical analysis was done correctly, you want to add your own ideas, you literally, all that you have to do is make one click and you're right there running, running the code without having to even install, install anything. And you can click and hear that. Let me play that again. You hear the whoop? That's this chirp. That's the sound of two black holes merging into one another 1.3 billion light years away. Brought to you by LIGO, 30 years of physics and engineering, and the open, and the open, source, uh, the open source stack. In addition to science, these tools have also been very widely adopted by industry. So these days, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and a host of other companies have commercial products that are built upon, upon a, this open source stack, and some of those pro pro products you may already be using. And we've also built a big community. So we have an annual conference. We it just finished a few weeks ago in New York. We had about 750 attendees. I'm particularly proud of this photograph, which is our, our student scholarship team. So these are students who applied for funding and from, with resources that we get both from industry and our grant providers. We actually brought, I think this year we had maybe 12 or so students, some international, uh, many domestic, um, who came to the conference from the cohort of a year ago of, of, of the same batch of students. Now one of those students actually works at one of the companies, uh, one of the main companies in, in, in Scientific Python, building tools for Jupiter. So he came to the conference uh, uh, sponsored by, uh, by the team. He participated in our development sprint, sprint on Saturday, really got into it, and now he actually has a job working, uh, working in, uh, in that. And so the lesson from these things is sometimes you have to make your own spaces. You have to create them because they're not exactly going to give them to you. If we had said, I mean, we were literally, I was literally told, stop doing this. You're wasting your career. Get back to writing physics and math papers. That's what you should be doing, right? That, I, I, that was explicitly told to me by senior people and by my peers, also by my colleagues, also by my classmates. They told me, stop doing this nonsense. And I didn't listen for whatever reasons. Uh, we're not going to get into that. But, uh, but the point is, you, you will have to create sometimes the spaces you need. 
So some of what I've ended up doing is actually that. It's the creation of different things. So in 2012, with John Hunter, was the last thing he did before he died, um, was five of us co-founded a, a foundation called NumFocus, which supports open source tools in science. And it builds, it basically lives at the bridge between the open source community projects, industry support, and academic research. But it's an actual 501c3 nonprofit foundation. Right now, the annual project, uh, the annual summit for the projects is happening in New York um, as we speak. Um, and NumFocus not only helps the code and supports the project on technical matters and fiscal matters and, and whatnot, it also has a, does a huge amount of work precisely on building the human communities around the code. And it has a variety of initiatives in that regard that, that, that I mean, we started it five years ago. Today, it's a much larger organization, and I don't really play an active role in there anymore, but I'm absolutely delighted to see these, these kinds of efforts growing. And again, sometimes you have to build institutional organizations to protect and maintain and grow the spaces that, the spaces that you need. At Berkeley, in a similar capacity, I got involved in 2012 and 2013 with the founding of what became called the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. This is a collaborative effort funded by these two foundations. Um, and uh, it's a grant that went to NYU, UW, and UC Berkeley. The three of us each did something slightly different. They're called the Data Science Environments. And what we did was we built an institute housed in the main campus library that is a space for data science research with a lot of emphasis on open tools, open source software, reproducible research, community building, all of these things that, that we could talk about. We have a number of people. Some of the folks who are, for example, running the lead development of the NumPy core, which is the core, the numerical core on top of which all of the scientific Python tools are built, are, uh, are, hi are hired and housed uh, at Berkeley and are led by, by scientists uh, who work at the Data Science Institute. And again, this was one of those things where you have to write grants, you have to work with the administration, you have to get space on campus. Space is the ultimate frontier, folks, especially on university campuses. Uh, <laughs> and, so, and, so, and so you have to do all that but it's the only way that certain larger scale efforts can be sustained beyond kind of one-off spurts. And so this is hard work, but you really, really, really have to do it. All of this path actually did lead me into kind of regular academia, and it's very interesting uh, for me to be speaking to uh, a group of statisticians because, as I said, I'm not a stat statistician myself. It's been a huge learning experience for me. My training was, yes, I was doing quantum field theory, but there the statistical part in quantum field theory is mostly about the interpretation. It's not statistical inference in the way that I think a lot, and analysis in the way that a lot of statis statisticians thinks about, think about statistics. So I've had to learn a lot, um, but I was delighted an honor to be offered a position last year at UC Berkeley. So I've, I've only been at UC Berkeley as faculty for, uh, for one year before I had, um, I had these, appoint these kind of weird appointments in, in the Data Science Institute and Neuroscience and as opposed to all of this very meandering career path. And in stats, I'm not going to pretend to be a better statistician than any, than any of you because I'm not. Many of you in this room know way more statistics than I do. And I will completely own up to that. And I'm talking to you, the undergrads, by the way. Uh, not, not the few fancy faculty that we have. Um, but what I have done is work on building good computational tools for science that I think can play a role um, in statistical thinking and that I think are extremely relevant. Um, and, and one of the topics that I, uh, that I want to mention is the work that we've been doing trying to embody this quote from David Donahoe, who's faculty in stats at Stanford, and who wrote this back in 1995. And David is a st he's faculty in stats, but he kind of lives at the interface between statistical and numerical, anal and numerical analysis. So he's a very, very strongly computational guy. Um, this was as part of a paper on WaveLab, which was a packet for wavelet-based signal processing. And I strongly believe in that. The problem is there are technical and educational barriers to doing a good job with that. So my first job at Berkeley in uh, the fall of 2017 was to teach a course that, I called co that is called Collaborative and Reproducible Data Science. It had been created before by Philip Stark. Um, and, uh, and it was a course that tried to teach not only the, the philosophy and the ideas behind reproducible research, but actually the practical skills. And what I want you to focus on are the, is the bold face. Because we made specific choices on the tools that you may, we can argue about. Uh, we can argue about whether to use this or that tool for this or that part, but the core notion of making part of the scientific workflow, good version control practices, automating your code with a programming language and not only tools that you click around on, um, that then allow you to use process automation tools, using a good open source toolkit, documenting your work with the proper tools, testing, testing the validity 
of the things that you're doing in your code. Um, then building tools that let machines integrate that automatically so that as your project evolves, you know that you're not breaking the stuff that you did three months ago. And finally, exposing that to the public in an easy way so that you can give them the kind of one link, one click link that I showed you for the LIGO stuff. Um, turns out that all of this can be taught to undergrads. If you structure it right, you can do all this in a semester I had. It was a cross-listed course with 50 undergraduates and 10 grad students. It was listed as a statistics course, but I had students actually from all over campus. And, uh, and the feedback was great. I won't go into all the details of the course, but the feedback was fantastic. We had, I had one student who actually started contributing to open source projects. He started making contributions to Pandas um, at the end of the course. Um, I had one student who basically turned a project he was working on in, uh, in econometrics, in causal inference in econometrics, and said, oh my god, I realize that I really need to beef off the computational part of this project much better. Can you, will you mentor me on that side, and I'll, I'll keep my econometrics mentors, but, 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 but I want to work on this, uh, on the computational aspect better. And finally, um, I was really, really happy about this, uh, this undergraduate who came with a background in journalism, and she was a Chinese student who actually struggled with language barriers, and as a, somebody who came as a foreign student in the U.S., I'm very, very sympathetic to that. Um, and her, she didn't have a technical background, journalist from China, and she really, really got into this and actually decided to try to apply to data science pro graduate programs in data science. We talked about it, gave her, gave her some letters. She applied to all the top programs. She definitely shot for the stars, applied to Johns Hopkins, Columbia, et cetera. Got admitted to all of them and eventually chose to go to Columbia. Um, and as far as I know, she, she's, she's doing great. She, this is her first semester now. So, so these things can be taught. Uh, that was a, a small course. These are the monsters. <laughs> so that picture was taken a couple of weeks ago. That's, for those of you who have been at UC Berkeley, that's Zellerbach Hall. That's not a classroom. That's the Symphony Theater on campus. Because it's the only place where we can fit 1,300 students. So that's the opening day of Data 8, Foundations of Data Science, which is a course that teaches core statistical inference and data science skills to for incoming first-term freshmen of any major. And we have 1,300 students. Um, campus will not lend us that, that, that room, it's already complicated to get it for one day. So what happens is that's the opening class. And then after that, they get moved down here. This is me teaching the upper division course of the follow-up to this, which is an upper division course aimed at juniors and seniors. And then we have 800 students. Um, and, uh, and these move down here. And obviously, they don't fit uh, because the room fits 750. So we just tell them not to show up to, not all to come to class. And they watch it online. <laughs> And we kind of let, let them average out. Uh, if, if, no, really, seriously, that's what we have to do. Because the room, otherwise we're violating fire code by 500 people. <laughs> right? <laughs> These are the fastest growing courses in the history of UC Berkeley. Um, once we reach steady state, and we're getting close to that. We're getting close to like the growth is beginning to slow down. We're on average going to be hitting probably somewhere around half of the campus. And Berkeley is not MIT, right? It's not a tech-only school. It's a broad university with majors all over the place. I'm talking about 50% of the campus, not 50% of the stats department or 50% of EECS or physics or math. It's 50% of campus. So this is causing this very interesting transition where at UC Berkeley, the undergrads are beginning to be the most computationally kind of fluent of the campus, including the faculty. And this is actually causing some, something very interesting is beginning to happen there. And I'm really, really eager to see what the place looks like in five or 10 years. Because we're already seeing comments from faculty who actually basically say, like, I'm, I'm seeing these incoming undergrads that I hire now, and they're completely fluent with all, of these, uh, with all of this tool stack, and in some cases, more than they are. And so something very interesting is happening. Um, this is the, a topic worthy of a full talk. The people who have done all of the work on this uh, deserve all the, all the credit, not me. I'm, I literally just showed up to teach that, that course in the spring when most of the work was already done. Um, but it really is something that's very interesting that is, that is happening there. And it's kind of opening up data statistics and data science and its impact basically to all of society. Um, and by the way, all of that is being taught. The reason we can teach that is because we host these Jupyter tools online. Even if students, for financial reasons, don't have a good laptop, it doesn't matter. Because they walk to the library, they borrow a Chromebook, and they can do everything off a Chromebook that the library will provide for them. Now, the last two points that I want to make, one is on representation. Um, we all want to build a world where we break boundaries across Whichever one of these lines is the most impactful to you, this is something that we, I fundamentally believe in. 
and, and it does matter. Representation does matter. Um, this is a really great article that, that came out a few, a few weeks ago in the New York Times about Naomi Osaka, who just beat Serena Williams um, at the U.S. Open. And in the article, if you read it, uh, Na Naomi is, uh, is a Japanese woman, and Japanese is a, uh, Japan is a country with kind of a complex history around, uh, around uh, race and ethnicity, and so her success is kind of challenging notions of identity in Japan. But there's a really interesting uh, quote uh, in the article from her father, uh, Francois uh, Osaka, who was not a tennis player uh, himself, but he saw things about how Serena uh, and Venus's father had basically built up kind of a playbook to teach his daughters and to train his, his daughters and make them become, I mean, help them become the, the amazing champions that they are. And basically he said, I didn't have to think it through. He saw that playbook. He knew that Venus and Serena were the heroes they were, and he had kind of written the playbook, so I just had to use the playbook. And so this is, part, this is one example of, of, I think, a really stark example of why representation is important. On the other hand, we also have to make progress in the world we live in. I was a teenager in Colombia who, because of watching a bunch of Carl Sagan's uh, Cosmos documentaries, really, really got hooked into science. And, but these were role models that culturally and personally and ethnically and along most dimensions other than gender, I have really nothing in common with these people. But, but the, one thing that, the, the one thing that I do have in common with them and that we all have in common is we're humans. We're humans with a brain. And what I had been taught by my dad and by others was that as long as I could read the books and I could read their ideas, I could stand next to those ideas and I could stand next to those people and learn from them, challenge them, I mean, obviously not in person, but challenge their ideas, right, and, and, and work on their ideas because I have as much of a brain as they do. And that, that was important too. So I think we need to keep both of those axes in mind as we work through because we can't simply wait for everything to be exactly the way we need it to be um, in, in terms of representation. Uh, though we, we will keep fighting for that and we will keep working on that, but at the same time, we can make progress if we remember that at the end of the day, it's all about the brains and the ideas. Um, and on that dimension, we are equal. And the second point that I want to make uh, in uh, as we wrap up is about careers. And remember that I said it was a second advisor? So choose your first one if you end up going to grad school really carefully. Um, better than me. Because the power dynamics is stacked against you, unfortunately. Systemically, systemically that power dynamics is stacked against you. And fairness and good treatment unfortunately often will depend on the person because the system isn't quite there always. And I think things are improving, but, but this, is, uh, this is something that you need to keep in mind. By the way, I don't want to scare anyone because there are amazing, amazing mentors out there. Those exist. Um, but it can be problematic. And one thing you should do is do due diligence. It is your life. You are the one in power. You are the one who has the right to ask hard questions, and you should ask those questions from former students, from former postdocs, from other faculty, right? Really do due diligence. This is an extremely important relationship, and one where when th if things go south, it can be problematic for you. Now, a good mentor is not someone who babies you, okay? A good mentor will push you, and they will push you hard, very, very hard, but they will treat you as somebody who, who really deserves and merits respect. Um, and if you're in a bad relationship, walk away, and walk away early. Because my second mentor thing came up way too late, um, and that was extremely damaging and problematic. And so I didn't have, no one told me these things when I was starting grad school, and I wish somebody had. I don't know, maybe I wouldn't have started iPython, so who knows. We are what we are today, but, but at, at least I, I do hope that this helps um, someone in the room. And finally, in terms of careers, because I know I'm running out of time, what about non-academic careers? We're at a university, many of us here are faculty. We talk a lot about academia and academic careers. I've had many, many conversations with people who hit a hard crisis um, in their postdoc years, after their postdoc years, or maybe towards the end of grad school, about perhaps academia is not for me. And I'm glad that we've had actually here conversations about folks who chose to not stay in academia. Because as much as I love the university and as much as I hope we will continue funding research and education, and I, it's something that I want to do for the rest of my life, I also want to make it sure that no one who chooses a different path does it
feeling that they're being, that they're either a failure or that it's because they didn't work hard enough or not smart enough. All of this nonsense, I've had it either thrown at me or thrown at people that I care about. And I have seen the damage that this nonsense does to people. And I want to make sure that none of this, if anybody ever tells you any of these things or makes you feel any of these things, push back and push back hard because it is nonsense. And there are organizations, actually this one is called Be it's actually called beyondacademia.org, and it was created by Berkeley postdocs and neuroscience students precisely to build relationships and paths and options out of there. There's many others, um, there's many others, um, other options and career paths, but the main message is we love research, we love science, uh, we're here because we're interested, um, and I hope you will, actually many of you will choose to go to grad school and pursue a graduate education, that time will be valuable in many, many, many ways that have nothing to do with whether you do follow an academic career path or not. That time is intellectually, personally, and socially valuable, even if you do complete a research PhD and then you do other things. Um, so with that, uh, I think I'll close here, and thank you so much for your attention.